welcome everybody to the Green Roofs, Green Walls webinar here in the Bronx. Uh, we are going international today with a guest of experts. My name is Bob Beter. I'm a local businessman. I am involved in very various green communities here in the Bronx. And I'm very happy to have with us today the senator from the 33rd district here in the Bronx, Senator Gustavo Rivera. Thank you, Bob. Welcome. We also have with us Steve Ritz from New York City Department of Education, the Discovery High School. We have with us Jess Danhauser from the Social Services Child Welfare Program, Graham Windham. And we have with us John Butler from New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, and Javier Lopez, the Executive Director for New York City Strategic Alliance for Health. What we're going to do today is we're going to basically have a roundtable discussion and some questions and comments from these wonderful panelists in order to let everybody out there know what the Bronx is doing with green roofs, green walls, and what the benefits are and why everybody should do this internationally. So, Senator, I'm going to begin with you, if I may. Uh, I would love for you to comment on the health inequities in your district. Well, the, the district that I represent in the Northwest Bronx is, uh, is a district that has a lot of working class uh, and, and certainly poor folks in it. A median income of about $25,000 a year and very high rates of obesity, diabetes, heart disease. Uh, so having, uh, so the, the great thing about, about when we're talking about green roofs, it is just one more way that we can actually utilize the resources that are available to us as far as buildings that don't have uh, that are just black tar on top there's ways that we can actually turn that into something that uh, d you know the Bronx was farmland at one point so if we're gonna if we used farmland hundreds of years ago there's no reason why we shouldn't use it today to actually encourage folks to uh, not only develop work skills but also uh, be able to grow fresh fruits and vegetables right here on the roofs of the Bronx so that we can address some of these health inequities that yeah. that are here well black roofs throughout any major city basically raise the temperature of the entire city. Mm -hmm. And the green roofs will bring that back down and help in the health initiatives in many ways like that as well. Uh, Javier, you are uh, in the uh, health area. Would you perhaps like to comment on the benefits of green roofs in terms of the healthcare industry? Well, in the healthcare industry and just in public health in general, what green roofs will provide is it will decrease the amount of uh, fossil fuels that are, exist in the community. In the Bronx, unfortunately, there are high rates of asthma. In the Bronx, it's a huge thoroughway for the food the food industry because of Hutts Point. So you have to counteract that, and green roofs are the perfect uh, you know, mechanism to provide folks with healthy and fresh air in, in, in a building where they may not have that, that access. And in other ways, it provides safe areas for the young people and for the elderly to actually go up on their roofs and learn about nature and expose them to agriculture from a very early age so that when they're going out in the stores in their community, they can have some type of reference point where they currently don't have right now. So I think it creates a new vehicle for uh, young people and families to go ahead and purchase fruit and vegetables because they'll be living it, they'll be living in a building that has that opportunity and they'll be going outside and showing folks they can actually buy it. Well, you're talking about purchasing. Uh, I understand there is a uh, Bronx Can initiative going on. Perhaps you can explain that to us. Well, it's the, the Bronx Can Health Initiative. Can stands for Changing Attitudes Now. Now, as we, as we just briefly spoke about, the rates of diabetes, heart disease, uh, obesity in the Bronx are extremely high. It's actually the unhealthiest county in the entire state. So partnering up with folks like the Bronx Green Machine, the Bronx Borough President, other elected officials, and community-based organizations, we thought, how do we bring attention to this issue? So in my case, I've struggled with my weight my entire life, and I sometimes don't have the best of... Uh, the best attitudes as, as relates to health. So I said, I'm going to make myself an example. I weighed myself publicly. I weighed in at 299 pounds. And I said, in, from there to October 24th uh, of this year, of 2011, I would lose 20 pounds. But it was less about losing the weight and it was more about saying, I can provide an example of the things that we can do to actually lead healthier lives. And so on the month of July, we spoke about, about nutrition. And we visited all the green markets in the district, told the people this, you know, we are in a food desert, but there are places that are available to you so that you can get fresh fruits and vegetables. And the great thing about, for example, uh, for having green roofs 
is that we could actually expand the accessibility of people to having healthy fruits and vegetables available to them so they don't have to go far away to get them. So if they do that, if they eat healthier and they actually regularly exercise and have long-term goals, we can all be healthier as individuals and ultimately as a community. Uh, but, I, but the reason why I support projects like this is because, again, we need to have that access available everywhere, not just in certain parts of the district that are close to a green market or two. Mm -hmm. Well, that's terrific. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, John, uh, you talk about putting these up on roofs. And, you know, a lot of these buildings are rental properties here in the Bronx. These are privately owned buildings. Of course, the city HPD, who you represent, uh, through city initiatives can put these up on the roof. Is the city planning on doing some of these? And can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the vast majority of um, HPD funded projects in the Bronx um, usually will can't contain some sort of green component. Um, the Bronx Borough President and Council people have been um, very generous in uh, releasing reservoir funding for green initiatives, also funding green roofs. Um, as far as the HPD is concerned, uh, we cannot use city capital to fund green roofs. Um, there's not a lot of research showing that these are going to have um, cost-saving benefits to these uh, larger story buildings in the long run, but um, you can use old, um, other funding sources uh, to fund green roofs, and we have. Um, you can look no further than Via Verde, uh, which was developed by Jonathan Rose Companies and Phipps Houses with HPD money. Um, there's an extraordinary amount of green initiatives going on, agricultural on top of the roofs. Uh, the issue is um, it's just been built. So we still have to see how this is going to be able to run. Um, at, are there going to be cost overruns or is it going to be sustainable through maintenance and operation? That's something we'll look at closely to see if we can do more projects uh, with these type of green roofs in the future. Okay, how about private sector? Uh, both uh, in the apartment buildings as well as in the commercial properties. Well, and new construction. With new construction, if you're talking about market rate apartments, um, if you want a green roof on your roof, no problem. You have your developer equity, you have um, bank loans, um, and you'd want a green roof uh, for marketing purposes. Um, you may be able to have sell the uh, space as different community space on top of the roof. Um, and therefore you could probably boost uh, your rental rate up. Um, when we're talking about affordable housing, affordable housing, um, we, need to, we need to build the highest quality housing and most cost effective price. Right now, green roofs have um, a very high uh, cost for its original installation. And right now we're seeing with maintenance and operation, that can really uh, burden a, a, bu a building's maintenance and operation costs in the long run. So what we'd like to do is see uh, more research and development with green roofs and see how that they can better um, function in buildings that are nine story and above, which are a lot of what the new construction projects going on in New York City are. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Steve, you have been working in the educational department with DOE for a number of years at Discovery High School, and you've been growing fruits, vegetables, plants. Tell us, tell us a little bit about what's going on within the New York City school system to encourage this and to teach this. Well, it's never been a more exciting time for all of us in the public education system because much like the Bronx Can Initiative, we're finding that we can change attitudes now and it's really about access and education. So even from a scientific point of view, when you show kids what is going on in their environment, and some of the things that I think we really need to go back and look at are the way we filter our air. These green roofs help filter and they help cool the environment. Cooler kids are better behaved kids in the summer. Um, they mitigate storm water. You know, we lose, so many kids are playing on blacktop. When you talk about combined sewage overflow, anything that makes our communities healthier and absorbs water um, is going to have a beneficial effect for the environment which creates an educational environment. Now in terms of growing vegetables, wow, on green walls and green roofs, the bottom line is we're planting seeds and we're planting seeds not only of plants and vegetables, but we're planting educational seeds. We're teaching kids to revision their lives. 
Um, most of you in the room know that I grew up thinking the world should be a better, it would be better if it was all dark and indoors. And after 20,000 pounds of vegetables grown in the Bronx, what we realize is, yeah, I'm growing vegetables, but really I'm growing engagement. We're growing hope. We're growing citizens. We're growing voters. Um, and we're growing people who are taking an active stake in their life. And if they tend to grow it, they tend to eat it. And if they eat it, the social health benefits are just phenomenal. Um, in addition to the fact that we can do it now indoors and locally and give access to food for people in areas that really can't afford it nor have access to it, all the while driving real scientific learning. Um, you know, the process of planting, patience, the ordinal, the reading, the writing, the math, all that stuff is the STEM stuff that's going to change the future. What we're doing today, we didn't do yesterday, and what we're doing tomorrow, we're not going to be doing five years from now. And this kind of technology, as the world continues to get smaller, hotter, and more crowded, and increasingly more hungry, is really, really important. And it excites kids. It really does excite kids, and it allows them to make money. You know, we have the only profitable student-run farmer's market in all of New York City, and you get 500 parents to show up in the middle of the week. That says something to engagement. That allows dialogue in ways we've never even imagined. It's no longer about the vegetables. It's really about, you know, welcome to a community school. And community schooling, you know, is really what all of us are about, particularly in this borough. That's great. That's great. Jess, in terms of, you know, Steve is teaching high school students. In terms of the younger children, the social service benefits, can you tell us about that, how, how the younger children will benefit from these green roofs and green walls? Grand Wyndham serves hundreds of um, children in the Bronx and other boroughs in New York City, and we are, um, many of those children are in foster care or in families who are struggling to make ends meet. The reason Graham Wyndham got involved was because Steve wouldn't leave us alone. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, the, the reason we got involved was because we want to make sure every single one of those children has the preparation and opportunity to succeed in life. Um, this does both. It gives children um, and teenagers tangible success. They watch what they grow and they feel like they're doing something. It's changing their attitudes now. It's changing their attitudes absolutely immediately as they see themselves be successful. Most importantly though, they really need a pathway to prosperity. They need a way in, that's gonna work for them and not, um, all that self-esteem matters an extraordinary amount, um, but it doesn't add up to anything if it doesn't change their future. And what this does is put money in their pocket. Um, it's a it's a growing industry. It is something that they are um, beating their peers to uh, the expertise. So they understand things that um, other kids um, don't necessarily have. So they're going to be um, desirable in the marketplace. So it's been an extraordinary um, early entry for Graham Wyndham to get involved in this, and we're hoping to just continue to expand that and to get more and more involved um, in the community and any way that we can um, achieve those two things, which is preparing our children um, and then giving them the opportunity to succeed in, um, in life. That's great, that's great. Senator, in terms of the green roofs and green walls, we're hearing about a lot of health benefits. Uh, job creation is on several levels. Uh, with healthcare costs being so high and, and the unemployment rate in the Bronx in particular being, I think, the highest in the nation, it is actually about, it hovers around 13% in my district. Yeah, it's really high. Uh, how do you see state and city government getting involved so that we can do more job creation through the green roofs and have a healthier lifestyle and, and help cut our health care costs as well? You know, these are factors that maybe they're not calculating in to the overall cost and the maintenance of these projects so that we can proceed with more of these. I think it, it's, it's pretty clear that when, and, and, and Steve said it, we are going to be, in the next five years, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be changing about the way that we, you know, how people are employed. I mean, just in the last couple of generations, we've gone from a place in which uh, a person could expect to be at one job and retire. Uh, the majority of the people would, would expect to be at one job for their entire lives. And if I'm not mistaken, there is uh, maybe like seven, the, the, the uh, the stats show that somebody who's graduating today will have about seven different mm -hmm. careers in their lifetime. So 
this, what we're, what we're doing with this, if we can actually implement, I mean, the great thing about what Steve is doing is that he is giving them the skills. He's giving these kids who are just in high school the skills that are just the basic building blocks for more advanced skills as it refers to green jobs. And if we're talking about uh, the, the, one of the things that we have to do to be able to make it, to make a green technology, uh, you know, accessible is to make sure that we that we see it that that corporate America sees it as a money maker. So if we if we're going to make sure that this is something that we that we implement not only because we need to to be able to 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 live, you know, to be able to live in this world that is that is increasingly getting hotter and increasingly getting more crowded. One of the ways to be able to, to guarantee that is to make it a money maker for corporate America. And the best way to, to have the young people right now, uh, and just not just young people, but everybody, everybody else that is unemployed, is to give them this level of skills. So if we actually implement training at the same time where we're doing these, uh, these green roofs, if we teach people how to actually, how to actually do it, and it, becomes, and, and it becomes as we expect it to take off in the next couple of years, we are giving them skills that will make them employable for the next 10, 15 years. So that's what, that, that's what, we're, that's what we're thinking about. If we can actually implement this, uh, the type of work that, he, that, that Steve is doing, if we can actually implement it into, uh, into other educational facilities so that it becomes part of the overall curriculum, like we, again, we might be giving them, we will be giving them skills that will employ them for the next generation. Yeah. I just want to echo something. As we sit here in one of the biggest retail strips in the Bronx, imagine, if you will, in this Google age where people are watching from satellites, marketing on roofs indigenous to, to green roofs. In other words, logos, a Target logo, a, a someone's logo in colors year-round on the roof so instead you know, for advertising. I mean, that's just one way of looking at it, but the industry itself breaks into a couple of different things which are really wholly inclusive. And one thing that we need to be certainly more of is inclusive, particularly in our community. So you have basically the maintenance and installation. These are living things. So they provide a lifetime of service. It's a living organism. Living organisms need to take care of themselves. So there's the maintenance, the installation. That's an ongoing process. It's not only about the sales. Then there's the research and development. If you were to tell me five years ago that I'd be growing vegetables on the walls of my classroom, I would have really needed to take a good look at both you and me. <laughs> Yet here I am, and I'm looking to do it a new way next year. So there's the research, the real cutting edge technology. And then there's the customer service piece, okay, because we're doing it with computers, we're doing it accessing information, we're doing it in taking orders. The basic skills that are going to translate into any kind of real employability. I think then there's just the routine work that's done. Most importantly, it allows entry into a job that pays well and allows entry into what I call a living wage um, here in the Bronx for people who, for many reasons, don't have access to that. It's also a very forgiving career um, because you can make a mistake, and there are people in the Bronx who have made mistakes um, who understand this. And more importantly, it's technology that we're doing here that we could export globally. The Bronx is just filled with immigrants who are coming to the United States because they're hungry. And here we are. We're showing them ways to grow food that they want to send back home. Um, mm. And of course, the culinary piece. Um, everybody wants healthy, fresh food, whether it's a smoothie, whether you want a chef, whether you want to be a sweet chef, whether you want to be in retail. Javier's doing wonderful work getting <laughs> fresh food into bodegas. And this is creating opportunities for our kids to get out there and market, even in their own native language, within their own community, and grow some of the things that they want locally. Microgreens grow in seven days, and they go for twenty dollars a pound. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to do the math. That, that's real numbers. <laughs> just, just to build on that, uh, many of our kids um, in their childhoods don't um, venture out far from their neighborhood. Our kids who've been involved in this program with Steve and with John and others, they've already been out to the Hamptons to put, to put a green roof on top of a ten and a half million dollar brand new house, and then they're coming back and seeing themselves as. Um, as the agents of change in their community. So they're, they're redesigning um, parks and they're able to um, really see um, a real tangible change that suddenly they're not the ones who are getting this service, they're the ones who are serving. And they're really um, leading their communities. So that it's an, not only does it expand their horizons, they bring those, um, that expansion of their knowledge back to their community to make their community better. During the mayor's first initiative, uh, first term, he did a study on youth services throughout the five boroughs. And one of the things that came out from that study was every dollar spent on youth programming 
the city gets back sevenfold. <laughs> okay? So, you know, this is just one more area where it shows, you know, when you spend a few dollars extra on training, on education, on healthy living, you're getting it back in terms of job creation, you're getting it back in terms of healthier living, you're getting it back in terms of students that went from a 40% attendance rate to a 96% attendance rate and become productive members of society instead of burdens on society. These are the kind of things that green roofs and green walls have a tremendous potential to, to help our market, to help our, our city and, and, and in our entire country. So, you know, working together and, and hopefully internationally, we can bring more and more of these together. Uh, I just put solar panels on my roof. My family business, Westchester Square Plumbing Supply, we put solar panels on. That could not have been done except for the benefits that were offered to us through mm -hmm. programs like NYSERDA, New mm -hmm. York State Research and Development, through New York City's uh, green initiatives and their tax breaks on that as well. So, and, and even in the Bronx here, through the Borough President's Office, there's the Bronx Initiative for Energy and the Environment. Without these government programs, you know, there's not enough of people doing this to bring the cost down yet. Correct. So for the first few years, at the very least, until the benefits outweigh the costs, we're going to need city and state and local governments to mm -hmm. kick in and give these incentives to continue these things happening. I agree. I have a two-year, three-month return on investment on my solar panels. It's phenomenal. It's a no-brainer. Without the tax credits, that same return on investment would have been 15 to 20 years mm. and just wouldn't have made any sense. So these are the kind of things that we need from you, Senator. We need you to take back to the city agencies and let them know that these are critical aspects. Uh, I do believe that as the demand grows, the price will come down, just like in everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have to create the demand by lending a helping hand to start off with. And it's part of our responsibility. I believe that there's, there's, enough, uh, there's enough that we see here the, as far as the positive results. Uh, we're talking positive results as far as environment, as far as uh, uh, the ecology, as far as education. The, the, I mean, there's so many different things that it ultimately gives us as, a po yeah. as positives yeah. that it is part of our job, our responsibility in government to try to make it easier to get to that point where it becomes cost effective for right. for somebody like yourself not to need uh, a, you know a tax incentive to be able to do something which will ultimately be positive for everybody so it's part of our responsibility to and do I that I think when the state and city calculates the return on investment adding in all those other factors Precisely. they'll find that these benefits pay for themselves in no time at all you can wait the 20 years as a state it's hard for a business to wait 20 years for a return on investment Indeed. <laughs> but I'm gonna tell you I think also increasingly smart businesses are really positioning themselves with the kind of green branding. So when you Absolutely. create a store that is a destination because of a green roof or a green wall, you are differentiating yourself in the marketplace Absolutely. in ways that you can't begin to imagine. And I think that, listen, I, I want as many benefits and as many incentives out there, but I really believe that what I'm finding, and I'm a public educator, so make no doubt about it, I, I depend on everybody else, but I'm finding the biggest boon to this has really been corporate America, um, because there's an opportunity here for businesses to brand themselves in ways they've never branded themselves Absolutely. before. There's a way to get involved with corporate America getting a tax write off but they're also getting the branding plus the team morale. Understand, a building that, and that has a green roof, what is it? It's, it's In a lot of ways, it's crime-proof because the kids themselves, they call this green graffiti. They take ownership of it. What else happens when, when a neighborhood is cooler? Crime goes down. When crime goes down, the police presence goes down. And it, it's, it, there's, there's all kinds of ways to re-engage people from private sector and creating customers for life. I mean, you know, one of the best ways of addressing the cradle to prison pipeline is by creating opportunities where kids get integrated into real jobs. And whether the government's providing them, and I'll certainly take those, but really the private sector is getting those. We could do lunch and learns, and you can actually build your next generation of middle class right here mm -hmm. and kind of reconfigure what we're doing with our own environment, whether it's mitigating trash, mitigating stormwater, mitigating environmental stuff. Um, that's only going to have a better benefit for all. One thing I want to just bring it back to the Bronx. One of the major concerns that you would have moving and looking at this initiative forward is that you would hope that the investment in green roofs keeps individuals who live in the Bronx in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to see this as an opportunity 
for uh, an expansion of gentrification where people get priced out of their communities. So that with the green roofs, hopefully costs do go down to the business, to the building owners, and then the reinvestment of those business owners to rehabilitate some of the buildings that have fallen on, on harder times can go and take effect and that the people that live there can actually see that happen. That's the potential I hope, want to see for the borough that you know the greening of the, the greening initiatives keep people in the buildings that they've been born and raised in and at the same time creates an, a, a utopia of sorts that people know that they can that it's for them and it's not for somebody else yeah. I think that's a major thing that you want to keep keep at the conscious of both this initiative absolutely you know the Bronx and in the city as a whole they've been talking so much about people moving out who can't afford to live here anymore and affordable housing is something I know has been very near and dear to your heart. It definitely has. Uh, and, and making the affordable housing is great. And of course, you know so much about this, but if you don't have access to a good, healthier lifestyle in that affordable housing, then you're, you're missing one of the huge components that's so necessary to help these people who are in need of affordable housing grow up in a healthy lifestyle, grow up in a happy lifestyle, a well-educated lifestyle. So this is an important aspect, green roofs, green walls, they bring a lot to the table in terms of those those items. You know, when you talk about return on investment, uh, my family in, in, in our business, we, we do a lot of green products, we look for a lot of green initiatives, and we look at return on investment on every green product. Because if I'm going to sell it to a consumer or to a contractor or a building owner, he's got to know what, it's, what his return on investment is. Mm -hmm. And, and our slogan is green puts you in the black. <laughs> and it's so true. You know, the green nice roofs can, can really put this city in the black. The green walls can put this city in the black. Because you add so much value that you're going to keep more of your middle class. You're going to have healthier lifestyle for those that are underprivileged or, or disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you'll have a stronger workforce as well. So all the combination of things, you're going to have lower health care, you're going to have more employment, you're going to have better living conditions. Mm -hmm. You know, Green Roof seems like a no-brainer to me in every way, shape, and form. Now, I don't think the uh, city is necessarily sold on the return of investment. This is um, an industry that's in its infancy. Um, we haven't really seen the return of investment um, take place to have the Green Roof paid back in full. When we're talking about affordable housing, where um, our subsidy is so limited, we need to make uh, these green roofs as cost effective as, as possible. So you've, you've thrown out the, the phrase there, potential um, return on investment, potential um, progress. So we need, I personally, I believe we need to do more with research and development, especially here within New York City. We have reports saying that there are, there are so many benefits to a building that's maybe one story, but what about these buildings that are nine stories and above? We don't have definitive proof that with such a large investment on a green roof that it's going to pay back to the developer. Now we have so many um, people who rely on affordable housing and fixed rates where their utilities are built in to their rents. If, they're, if, they're, uh, if the utilities go up, they're more rent burdened. So if green roofs are going to do what they say they're going to do, then this can be a very big initiative. And I think we need to reach critical mass with the demand of green roofs if we're going to really talk about uh, green roofs being a viable industry here in New York City. One of the potential, though, that is if you took and looked at the opportunity for research and development as a whole, as, as a whole, you can take the education component, the cost savings, and the health care component, in addition to the fiscal responsibility that's put onto the owner of the building, you, if you take the cumulative dollar amount, I think that will make a, a stronger argument than the argument that's being made right now, what you're looking at just purely as the, the cost benefit of the initial installation of the green roof. And I think that there lies the potential, I'm saying, for better research and development to make the, the case stronger, I think, to, to government officials. Sure. And I think the, the green roofs, too, I mean, so many so much going on with the green roofs as far as um, the impact of getting food from there. I mean, are, are we going to market affordable housing units to people who are well-versed in agriculture? That's a tough sell. Or are we going to have markets on the ground floor to buy local food? Again, these programs are very much in their infancy, and mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of great um, ideas, and developers have done a lot of great things uh, recently in making strides towards some of these programs, but we don't know how they're going to turn out yet. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. once we do more of the research and development, 
then we can start expanding the industry to a point where we're going to be able to hire more youth, more people in the green roof and agricultural industry. As, ha as Javier said, um, it is important to make sure that we're defining return well, right? Mm -hmm. there's, a, yep. there's a huge number of, um, of ways in which one can define return, and I think that, um, as Steve was saying before, businesses often, when they're deciding how to give back, or foundations are deciding how to, how to give, they say, are we going to get into health, are we going to get into children, are we going to get into community building, are we going to get into um, the environment? This has all of that, and I think it's important that the um, folks who are making decisions on how to make um, d define the return on investment consider that that broad picture. Absolutely, Steve. You know, in the classroom, you have built a tremendous green wall program, and I understand that the cost of that compared to the cost of a conventional science classroom varies somewhat. I'm so glad Why you brought you talk this up. To us about I'm that. Just, you know, because we talk about return on investment, and we talk about this other thing called metrics. And you know, metrics are going to say whatever they want, and return on investment is key. Um, so for example, kudos to everyone around this table for losing weight in the Bronx Can Initiative. I can't put a dollar value right now on what it been, has meant for me to lose 15 pounds thus far and 15 pounds there, but I'm sure down the line... Just eight. I just got eight. I got 12 to go okay. <laughs> for the 20. I just got, you know, I'm still working on it. But I can't put a dollar value now on, on what that means, but in terms of the longevity and the fact that I'll be at the doctor less ultimately translates into a new metric. I can't put a dollar metric on the fact that, guess what, my kids are in school every day on time um, because they're there. But I know what it costs to get a permitted, to get a truant officer. I know what it costs in terms of lost manpower. I know what it costs in terms of lost, lost class time, summer school, overage, undercredited. I know what that costs because it's a nightmare and it's a cost we all share. But instead, you know, this, we've got to really look at some of the other, you know, metrics for return on investment. Um, in my classroom, for example, what does a new set of textbooks cost? It's phenomenal. And how many of the kids engage themselves? Like, you need software. Then you got to upgrade the licensing. This green walls for me have become, and again, I'm practical. Um, I got into this as the mother of necessity. This became a way to have a portable science lab. It costs about $600,000 to build a lab in school. Um, here I have one on wheels. I take it anywhere I want to go. I bring it uptown, downtown, and it's virtually indestructible. And best of all, the manufacturing process of it itself can come right here in and of the Bronx, even with resourced and recycled stuff. And that kind of American attitude is priceless now more than ever. Um, it allows kids, again, to revision and reinvent and think about ways um, that they've never thought about their own world before. I mean, Javier spoke about kids taking ownerships of their community. Um, my kids from the Bronx, we've worked in some very nice neighborhoods. We've worked in Rockefeller Center. We've been in NBC. We've been to the Hamptons. And we've done work here locally in the Bronx. And all of what we're doing outside of the Bronx, we're bringing back to the Bronx. And this is really engaging kids in ways that we've never engaged them before. And it really cutting down on all the intervention costs um, in ways that we've never begun to imagine. So I understand the return on investment is key. Um, but I think you said six hundred thousand dollars for a conventional science, compliance science lab. lab. What about a green walls? What is that? Listen, two three thousand dollars for a lab in my school, and I'm hitting all the metrics. My kids are, are my kids are hitting metrics. We're reinventing education, and the best thing is, at the end of the day, we're, we're doing it in a way that's a brand new, novel experience. Um, you know, we really do live in this, what I call the age of nature versus Nintendo. And, um, <laughs> ha and probably Nintendo's the wrong word because Nintendo's not even hip anymore. It's whatever the new game is. Um, but really reconfiguring our environment um, to either feed us or nurture us, it also gives kids a tremendous palette of experiences and, and, and vocabulary, which are only really going to make them more functional. Um, not only in their own community, but getting out into communities where they can make a living and bring money back so there is less subsidized housing. So people can become the next generation of consumers and, and producers. And really, while you know, we always look for an economy and that's predicated on you know, consuming, the new economy is going to really be based on sustaining and creating these freestanding kind of independent models of engagement and involvement. And that's what this is really all about. Um, One of the things that I think that is a struggle for a lot of people in just hearing the term green roofs is that it doesn't have a tangible face. It doesn't have 
a, a point to look at. You look at downtown, they can consider the High Line a green, that's a huge green initiative, right? But then, then you look at people talking about the Greenway, that's a green initiative. I think with green roofs, there needs to be a tangible um, face or building for someone to see to provide government officials who are making those decisions who don't have the functional understanding of what that is to understand it. And I think that this initiative presents that potential because once there's an understanding, there's more support and there's more uh, ownership of the idea. Right now, I think there's too many people pulling at it and if we can come sometime, somehow consolidate the concept into a district or into a certain neighborhood that we can really look at and entertain the possibilities and at the same time provide the adequate empirical research then we can start seeing the growth of the industry moving forward. I think we have to just take ownership of it's it. That's absolutely right. right. And it, it's Sorry. so much more accessible to kids, kids who don't have much confidence in themselves to, to be successful. It's so much more accessible than one would think when they hear Green Roof. Um, there, it's, it, you know, learning can be intimidating for kids. You know, in, in school, um, learning something new, this is something they right away they get their hands literally dirty and they jump right in, so couldn't agree with you more. I think that's where the success of Green Roofs is gonna lie. One, um, through economies of scale. Yeah. Uh, right now, the way we're putting up buildings with Green Roofs, we have one building with a Green Roof in one neighborhood, another building with a Green Roof in another neighborhood. If we're gonna really uh, test water retention and uh, heat island cooling, if these buildings are together, mm -hmm. uh, then we can really study the benefits of a green roof, and that's where they're strongest. Yeah. Um, again, to the second point you made um, with visibility, I think that's another strength of green roofs. Um, when politicians are going to put money onto buildings for green roofs, uh, it's a very easy sell. You get your picture in the paper on the green roof, and uh, it's a lot higher vis visibility than, say, putting in a high quality ventilation system in a building, um, even though records show that that might make your building greener. The green roof gets your face in the picture, gets your building in the picture, gives you the visibility, and I think that's where it's going. Now, if green roofs can do the same amount of um, energy efficiency that some of our other models can do, like high quality ventilation systems, then we're talking about real sustainable growth in the mm -hmm. industry. Um, and again, the green roof industry is changing in ways that we never imagined. When I mean, and, and the Bronx has been the most important thing. And let's bring it back to the Bronx because, you know, five years ago, seven years ago, we were talking about you need a structural load of 85 pounds a foot, if you remember that. An insane number. We're down now to a structural load of 10 pounds per foot. And, and that's exactly the, the, the kind of research that, that's just indigenous to this whole movement that's really going to change things. So there's intensive roofs, which could be different layers, there's modular systems. Um, you know, I jokingly say the abandoned building has the green roof, and that's how most of the kids start with questions, you know, mister, why is a seed growing in the middle of the sidewalk? Well, that's a perfect example. Why is there grass in the subway? Um, that is a perfect example of what a green roof can be. Water accumulates as seeds grow and, and nature takes its course. Now, they could be cultivated, they could be left to be, um, you know, kind of natural looking, but in a city and in a community that is bereft of park space, imagine the ability of kids who can't go out, you know, because we can't play in traffic to go up. I mean, that to me, imagine if you're handicapped, you know, and, and limited or you're physically challenged, the ability to go up and be in a cool, nurturing environment. Um, Green Bronx Machine took over a lot on 108th Street. Um, and in two months, the amount of butterflies that have shown up found their way to Harlem. I don't know how. Is it, uh, <laughs> is, are they on the internet? But it's almost <laughs> as if I'm walking up 108th Street and I'm seeing bluebirds. I'm seeing red birds. I'm seeing kids make observations. And then they turn around and say, Mommy, don't drop that in the street. Daddy, don't drop that in the street. And we're seeing butterflies. Um, you know, let's really talk about some issues that are going to be that are going to come full to bear with all these returning veterans. The amount of horticultural therapy that is inherent in green roofs and green walls um, is just phenomenal. And you know, listen, no green thumbs here, but when it, when someone in a wheelchair can wheel themselves up to a wall and get involved in some kind of nurturing activity, when guys who are coming back bearing stress of epic proportions beyond anything I can imagine can lose themselves in a greenhouse. That's the kind of social therapy that's going to change everything. We're putting a green wall with um, Steve's generosity in our visiting space where parents who have children in foster care are coming to meet their children and work to 
heal that relationship and so the child can come home safely. So that environment has to be a place where that healing can happen. And something like this wall, um, there's many, many uses for it, but for us, it's really sort of a, an ornament to say, you know, things grow here, things are, um, things are possible here, and we think it's gonna really um, make it a much warmer space for people to be in to, to do that healing. And hopefully, the, you're gonna get me one, right? Yeah, but the return on investment, <laughs> let me just... <laughs> <laughs> he, said he, no, 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 he said he was gonna get me one. He said he was gonna get me one. At Graham Wyndham, where is this location going to be? 1946 Webster Avenue in Tremont. So people can come to Webster Avenue and Tremont Avenue when? to see what a green wall looks like. What do we think, Steve, in the next within week the two, two? Within the next two weeks. But here's an example. Just Call us first. We have some confidentiality. No problem. <laughs> here's, here's the issue, and, and this is the greatest point. I'm so glad you got it. It's not my generosity, so thank you, Jesse. It, it, it's my kind of spirit. But my kids got trained courtesy of Green Living Technologies, a corporate entity that does this, that has patented technology that created this opportunity. NBC brought these walls and gave our kids the opportunity to install walls in NBC. In NBC. NBC, in turn, donated back their walls to the community, and Graham Wyndham was one of the sites. So I was the facilitator. I'm not that generous. We really need to thank NBC. And that's the whole concept. Green is universal. And here, it was no city dollars. It was no state dollars. It was no federal dollars. It was all private money, and that private money got my kids trained, it got my kids paid, it got my kids to be indebted forever to NBC, and God willing, they'll shop at that store with some of the money, <laughs> and then guess what it did? It's going to touch untold generations of lives at Graham Wyndham. So thank you, NBC, and thank you, Green Living Technologies. And again, while people say we've got to look to the government, look to the government, I love the government, but I also think that, you know, the way that we can be creative um, with the private sector, and again, talking about return on investment. This green wall, courtesy of NBC and Green Living Technologies, is going to pay back exponential benefits in such lives in ways we've never even begun to imagine. So I'm really excited about it, but don't give me credit. I give you credit for being receptive, <laughs> because who would want to put plants in them? Oh, the kids are going to touch the plants. Isn't that great? <laughs> they should touch, you know, and then they, then they should eat them. And, and that's the beauty of having something that kids can come in and learn to eat off of things that occur naturally as opposed to things they can't even begin to pronounce they've been sitting on shelves for years and sadly on webster avenue i think you'll be the oasis of green you'll be the <laughs> mecca of webster avenue um sadly but that's the reality of it and um that's going to change people particularly this kind of clients that you serve um their lives forever in addition to really giving the kids something to be proud of mm -hmm. something to you know aspire to do with other people and funders are going to come in and want to see this and they're going to want their own I and mean, that's the beauty of it. That's really when you talk about the corporate piece, you know, yeah, we want government involvement, but this has cost all of us nothing and only made money. Uh, so thank you again, NBC, and thank you, Green Living Technologies. And there's a couple of sites that we're doing, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. And again, you know, that's also the borough president's vision for being so supportive. Yeah. But that's just trying to me just trying to make the sense of no dollars in a classroom, you know, in desperate times with kids who are showing up and wanting to be engaged. One of the things that you know, you talk about in terms of return on investment that, again, people don't generally think about is how the green roofs and the green walls lower the building's cost of operation as well as the cost of construction. Because when you're putting up air conditioning and heating equipment, you're basically adding an additional level of insulation. A green roof, a black roof, rather, will get up to 190 degrees. A green roof will never get over 90 degrees. So you've got a 100 degree temperature differential when you're trying to cool that building to 70. Instead of trying to bring it down 120 degrees, you only have to bring it down 20 degrees. That's and I, a tremendous difference in the cost of the equipment and the uh, function of the cost of the electricity to run the equipment. And somebody around this table probably know the numbers much better than me, probably you. As far as the, as we're talking about the percentage of energy that an, that an urban space that a city uses, the majority, and then and then the pollution that comes from it, the majority of it comes from cooling. And if we have, and if we have, so if we have ways to make to make uh, buildings naturally cooler, I mean, I, I, I use the word natural as a pun absolutely, here, obviously. Absolutely. We we actually can be we actually can be saving as a you know as a city, okay. we could be saving you know ben eventually millions and billions of dollars yeah. in costs over over the years. So. The senators hit the point dead on. The biggest contribute, the biggest polluter in New York City is not diesel fumes. It's not you know. I can make some political jokes, but I won't. But the, the biggest polluter in New York City are buildings. It's energy loss. 
So, and that's more than diesel fumes, that's more than trucking. Mm -hmm. So you are reducing the amount of heat loss and the reducing the amount of, of heat accumulation. You're really saving money. I mean, the Board of Ed pays $270 million a year in electrical costs, mm -hmm. heating and cooling. Imagine just shaking that number down 10%. Um, that's a savings of $27 million, and that's annually. Um, but then it's creating opportunity because that money is just not money saved. It's money reinvested. It's going other places for other things. It's phenomenal. Um, so buildings are the biggest polluters in New York City, um, straight off and straight out. And if you can mitigate that, you're really doing a whole bunch of other things. So good point. Thank you. Okay. I think we've come a long way. Is there anybody here who has anything to add that they'd like to uh, discuss, Ralph, right? You want to do another? You want to do another, another plug for NBC? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you. I think we should plug Green Living Technologies. Mm -hmm. Green Living Technologies is a green roof. Guy. Listen, I, if there's one thing I want to plug, it, it's the Green Bronx machine, and yes. there's a way to plug it that's phenomenal because you know. Talking let's, let's talk about the Green Bronx machine. You know, there have been so many green initiatives here in the Bronx, between the solar panels, the green roofs, and just green growing and green. The, the the creation of the the renew uh, the the fixing of brownfields and mm -hmm. uh, so many different programs that the Bronx is really seeing some tremendous growth. I mean, we we came out of the hard times, but we didn't only come out of the hard times. We said, okay, let's let's go on to the next generation, the next top quality life, and let's make it a green city. And we've done that in various aspects. Green roofs, green walls, definitely a great aspect of it. Cleaning up brownfields, another great aspect of it. We're there. Let's talk about what's happening in the West Bronx. Tell me about the Bronx Green Machine, and tell me about sort of like the, the type of work that you've been doing well, with I mean, them. Bob hit on a great thing. This, I, I grew up in this borough. I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but I grew up riding trains watching this borough burn, um, literally. Um, and, you know, I look at kids' addresses in schools, and I remember when their buildings were vacant. Um, you know, I mean, that's how long I've been doing this. When the buildings were, there was no building. That was a lot. Um, so no one is, is more thrilled to see the kind of investment in political leadership that we presently have in this borough than me. Because um, while I can afford to leave, I choose to stay. Um, and I love this borough and I love it passionately. So what's going on is, is here, mate, and it speaks to this whole Bronx can, which is change attitudes now. Because, you know, if you've been to my class, I say we are Americans. We are Puerto Ricans, Dominicans. <laughs> we are a borough and a people of cans. And we are changing our way. Now, what does that mean? When we talk about the borough with the highest disengaged number of kids, okay, because that's the educational reality. The Bronx is, I, I believe, leading but the, the city in true innovation, but we have a long way to go because of the community we're serving. But Bronx Green Machine, in two months, we've got 2,500 kids in the Bronx signing up on this website saying, I want to be involved. Um, and we can't even begin to accommodate it. I mean, and that's the kind of energy and enthusiasm. Now you talk about buildings being the biggest polluters. You got, I have the luxury of talking to five gentlemen who've all been to my classroom and been to my school and seen how spotless it is. Seeing the kind of pride that these kids have for their environment, which is something years ago we never had. Um, so what it, it changes everything. Um, so the Bronx Green Machine has just become a container for greening minds and greening hearts and, and, and greening perception. Um, you know, and it's great when my kids and, 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 and Jess's kids get out to the Hamptons. Uh, the upshot is a couple of them are now taking surfing lessons, and they're expanding. <laughs> they're expanding the parameters. That's surfing. Um, and, and it's really about building bridges, um, and that's really what Bronx Canton is all about. The Green Bronx Machine, it's much more than vegetables. It's about green infrastructure, about green mind, it's about green health. We have a student-run website, a student design logo. Everything that we're doing is student-centric. And what is it student-centric? And what is it telling us? It's telling us that kids want to be involved. There's not a kid who doesn't want to live in a nicer place. There's not a kid who doesn't want to be in a classroom that smells better. Uh, having our, we're, we're talking to a principal this morning whose kids are eating lunch adjoining to a dumpster. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that's shameful. That shouldn't happen. Uh, but the bottom line, if it does, we can now mitigate that. And we have technology and the ability to take the stuff that's in that dumpster and turn it into compost and turn it into cash. You know, here in the shadow of the Kingsbridge Armory, we could regrow, resource, and recycle our way into an economy that, that's, you know, 
that, that we've never thought about before. Instead of guys pushing cans for nickels, they could be pushing groceries to and from. Mm -hmm. um, returning soldiers could be engaged in therapeutic interventions they never imagined. Foster families could be growing healthy food together from their native countries and going back to their original tastes in ways they've never imagined. Happier people could be putting these things into communities where we've never had them. You know, we've got 35 flavors of blunt wrap and not, and not a vegetable on the shelf. Um, these are the kind of things that Bronx can speak to. And, you know, with all the negativity that could be associated with this borough, let's talk about really what we can do and what we are doing. And, and that's transformative. And what does it start with? It starts with something that is beyond ourselves. And that happened to be a green roof. Again, I've become this transformative educator not because I'm so brilliant. I just recognize the moment. And the kids are seizing it. Oh, excuse me. Um, the kids are seizing it, not me, um, because it's something different. And kids are inspired by different. In this age of 250,000 channels on TV, everyone wants to know what else is on. Um, but here, you know, this is something that's teaching patience, perseverance. It's planting seeds. And on that's that note, I, for, it, for me, up. I have to wrap it up. It is okay. time to wrap things up. I want to thank you all so much. Steve, I do want to say I had the opportunity to come to your classroom to speak to some of the students. And one of the things that I thought was so great was the fact that not only are the students eating healthier, but they're bringing it home to their families and they're making them all eat healthier as well. So it really is changing many, many more lives than just the ones in the classroom. I want to thank Senator Gustavo Rivera. I know you're working late and I know you still have more to do. Yes, sir. I really appreciate you coming out. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and again, I thank you so much for participating. In and this I thank you all for coming to the office. Green thank webinar, uh, international on green roofs and green walls. I want to thank Javier Lopez. I want to thank uh, John Butler and Jess Danhauser, and of course Steve Ritz. Again, I'm Bob Dieter, and I thank you all for tuning into our webinar. Thank you so much. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr., who continues to be a strong leader and staunch supporter of greening initiatives in the Bronx. And although he wasn't able to join the panel on their shooting day due to previous engagements, he now answers some questions for us and share some of his vision for the Bronx. In what ways and how is Bronx County different from other boroughs in regards to green infrastructure, green jobs, and specifically green roofs and other such urban agriculture? And is this an agenda, is this agenda a viable option for residents, politicians, and industry and employers in the Bronx? I think that the Bronx is leading the city in green buildings and green infrastructure. Uh, I think when you look at the statistics, there have been more green buildings or buildings with green roofs in the Bronx than another, any other borough. And the reason being is because when developers come to our office now and they want some type of assistance, uh, particularly with capital funds, uh, we are letting them know that we will not be supportive unless uh, they have some type of silver lead certification to their development. And we're seeing more and more developers now buy into this notion uh, more and more elected officials are supportive of these initiatives and that's the reason why uh, we're seeing buildings that are going up and development that's going up with uh, the green roofs, with wind turbines, with solar panels, uh, co-generate and ultimately I think it's going to result in more jobs in our borough. Why is it said that the Bronx is the city's greenest borough? Uh, I would again uh, put us up against anyone, uh, any other borough. If you look at the Bronx if you look at the amount of uh, work that's being done with our parks, with development, uh, with our schools, in our schools, more and more of our students are being taught uh, to uh, build green, to uh, have vertical farms. Uh, so I think that we're, we're leading the right way and we're very proud of that. When you look at this building, it's the only municipal building in the city of New York that has its own green roof. And that's something that we can brag about. And um, uh, you, you continue to see the Bronx leading the way in, in, in the green, uh, not only infrastructure, but in the future, you're gonna see us lead the way in the green economy. Given the negative health indicators of the borough, why is it important for the Bronx to embrace green technology like green roofs and green walls and urban agriculture? The, these initiatives are important to embrace because ultimately uh, when you look at some of the health disparities and our health issues, uh, obesity, uh, it's important for us to have uh, 
farms, uh, the, the farmers markets, when you look at asthma rates, uh, the, one the, the one biggest contributor to asthma and other respiratory ailments are buildings. And so when, you, when we, the, build, the greener that we build, the more that we're able to uh, not only clean up the environment uh, and, and, and have a healthy environment, but also you will see uh, less uh, emissions and, and less pollution that ultimately contribute to respiratory ailments that many Bronxites suffer from. Can you talk a little about the Green Bronx machine, the kind of work they're doing, and do you think, uh, is this a model worth replicating, and how can we go about embracing the kind of model that they're doing? You know, when I was a candidate for a borough president, I always said that I'm tired of just being the borough that's come back from ruins to revitalization. I've always said that we have the potential of being the borough that starts to lead in many other um, area, in many areas, when you look at the bronze green machine uh, and what Steve Ritz has done with the young men and women at uh, Discovery High School, we are certainly not just leading the the, the city. We're leading the state, the nation, and I, and I dare say uh, we're leading uh, many countries on this planet in the way that they are training our young men and women to build vertical farms. Uh, they've been highlighted by uh, CNBC. They've been able to do a vertical farm uh, on the in, in the display window of Rockefeller Center Plaza. Uh, they are now going and teaching uh, students abroad in other countries. Uh, you look at what Steve Ritz has done. You look at this technology. Think about it. Think about being able to uh, have when we say a vertical farm, uh, being able to pick a cherry or a strawberry uh, from, uh, from the hallways or from a, from a, a lobby at a, any particular building in the middle of winter. Uh, that will uh, not only uh, go a long way in making sure that people have fruits and vegetables even when they're out of season, but what we're really doing here is that there's a new technology and we're training Bronx kids uh, to be able not only to put up these vertical farms, but then go out and teach other individuals. That's happening right here in our borough. That's something that we can be proud of. And, and they're just amazing in that uh, they, they're helping with the, the reputation, they're helping with the image of the Bronx uh, to be that of a leader in this new green technology. And I'm so proud of them. Do you see this kind of uh, technology as an integral part of the current ongoing resurgence of the Bronx? It has to be. Uh, when you look at the Bronx and the fact that many years ago uh, you had m manufacturers here in our borough, many of them left because of the North American Free Trade Agreement or, or CAFTA, the, 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 the Central American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, these, the way that we're able to, to rebuild, the way that we're going to be able to provide jobs are going to be through this type of green initiatives. Uh, this is the way that we're going to get people to work. This is the way that we're going to be able to clean up our environment. This is the way that we're all going to be able to get healthier. So in other words, uh, having um, vertical farms and, and, and having green roofs and green uh, uh, infrastructure, that's the way that you get people to work by installing them or manufacturing those materials. Uh, to be able to have things like vertical farms is a way for not only to create jobs, but for people to eat healthier. And if you clean up buildings and if you make buildings green and you clean up the environment, then you have less uh, pollution. Uh, and therefore, you have less asthma, you have less bronchitis, cancer, and other ailments that are that are afflicting many bronchites. Any other closing thoughts or that you want to impart to the summit? I just want to uh, congratulate everyone, all of the organizers, for uh, convening this summit. I think that is important. I think that uh, people are starting to take us seriously at the citywide level and at the state level. Uh, when they look at the Bronx, they know that we're leaders in, in uh, green initiatives and in the green economy. And, and I look forward uh, to the day where uh, not only are we uh, able to uh, implement a lot of these initiatives and programs, but that other boroughs and other counties and throughout the state of New York, whenever they're ready and prepared to implement their initiatives, that they look to the borough of the Bronx for that leadership. I'm proud of the work that you're doing. I wish you well throughout the summit, and I know that in the future, the Bronx is gonna be much stronger because of the level of conversation and discourse that's happening throughout the summit. Thank you.